The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there everybody, this is your orchestration tutor Thomas Goss, bringing you our third collection of website subscriber entries for the 2021 Orchestration Challenge. This is an exciting bunch of scores and I'm really feeling good about it. It's first thing in the morning here in New Zealand and I'm looking at the window. There's some <clears throat> there's lovely dawn breaking out there over the hills. You know, Jerry, this is just so much fun. It is almost um, madcap <laughs> uh, cinematic scoring. It's it's very free and it's very fun, and you're just orchestrating with abandon. And and you know, I mean, there are some some things that I feel in terms of like concert music proportions are a little much. Like for instance, using a clapper, right? <laughs> Uh, instead of just like castanets, which I, I think would probably be more appropriate in a concert music um, idiom. <clears throat> also, like the repeated use of upsweeps on the harp, uh, you know, and, and, and so on. So, uh, however, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> uh, I have come to praise this piece, not to bury it. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, it's, it's not a question of of taste as much though I, I occasionally will make comments about you know like whether things like the the proportions of things work with the um you know the the way that the piece was written right the tastes of the composer <clears throat> so you know if you just get past that <laughs> um and just look at this piece to see whether or not it works. It really works, like the like the harp scoring in particular. So I feel that if anything, <clears throat> you should have had bigger bigger roles on your um, on your on these harp chords, right? So like just you know big like it, to make it even more audible, right? The, this chord could be played by one hand. But there's nothing wrong with having a chord where the harpist is playing more notes than could possibly covered by be covered by two hands and just rolling their way up the uh, up the strings. So you'd have like the left hand play the bottom part of the chord and then the right hand play the middle and then the left hand come up and play the top of the chord. So you could just have these beautiful wide gushing chords, I feel. I think that that would work really, really well and make the harp even more audible. And of course... Glissando is going to be <clears throat> very easy to hear. And also notice how the dynamics here are very, you know, they're very soft compared to other entries. You know, you're starting off with piano, and then a little push to forte. That's certainly not going to drown out the harp the way that you've got it scored with, you know, all winds. A little bit of clapper in there. <clears throat> and a little bit of, um, and then the harp chord is going to come through. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> I think that even the Celesta is going to be audible here. However, 
my advice would be to take it up an octave, okay, just to score your Celesta higher, and uh, that way it'll come through. The Celesta notes do not have to exactly be the same octave as the notes that they are doubling in other instruments. <clears throat> the instruments that will be playing that need to be doubled have a lot of nice high silvery overtones anyways, right? So when you're adding the Celesta to it, you are essentially accentuating the silvery overtones of these higher instruments. All right. <clears throat> so, so let's continue on, all right, um, with our evaluation criteria. Okay, so pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano, no pitches below middle C, does that make things a little too, um, you know, does that, does that kind of uh, keep things centered in the same place too much? In your arrangement, it doesn't because you, uh, you relieve the ear by having uh, bassoon and contrabassoon come in here and, and play some lower stuff. All right, so, so that is one way around. And also pizzicato, double bass right in here. <clears throat> and um, thematic material, possibly sounding repetitive. Eh, well, I mean, it, it, this is a bit of a copy-paste, except like you're adding a little bit of celesta, and we're introducing some snare drum rolls and a little bit of timpani. Um, so... <clears throat> Be careful about this. You have scored a 16th note beam on your timpani. So that is unclear. Like, it might be interpreted by the player to mean a roll or or maybe 16th notes. Uh, and, like, the question is, like, what did you want there? Like, usually when, uh, you know, like, a, a measured tremolo, in essence, is a reduction of notes that are um, that basically just kind of take up too much space right if we were to write out every 16th note that is uh, implied by this uh, double beam tremolo mark then you would um, then you know it just would would fill in this and if it went on for quite a while then you would really need this kind of scoring but you don't right this only happens twice so it's really important to to be incredibly clear about these kinds of things so that you don't get raised hands at rehearsals to really write in every note, right? So bump up up bump, right? If that's really what you mean, or if that's not what you mean and you really intended a triple beam tremolo, uh, so an unmeasured tremolo, like brrrm, right? <clears throat> then 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 yeah, write that in, right? So just maybe proof it a little bit better. Right, but but I would just say, you know, if you really intended, and I think you do intend your sixteenth notes here, write in the first one all sixteenth notes, and then we realize that the next one is a condensation, right, or a you know an abbreviation of the previous gesture. Okay, so um, continuing on, it, you know, we've got a little bit of bass clarinet in there as well to kind of vary things up. I mean, and I like that idea a lot. It's very simple and effective. And you are being mindful of the subtle variation between the two parts as scored in the piano uh, score. So, yeah, that's, that's very cool as well. There's a lot of real attention to detail in the score, um, uh, to a lot of the little details, right? So, which is... Why it's a little puzzling, you know, you, you maintained my error here <laughs> and you, um, and you introduced an, uh, an error or a, or a, a divergence from the original there, right? So it's like the, the, the error that is, is happening here is what should have happened correctly over here, right? So anyhow, <clears throat> yeah, look, I'm, I'm not really getting on the case of people who are critical about an error here or there, but look, I'm just trying to tell you that, you know, I want to focus on the joy here, all right, and, uh, and you know, and I don't want to get hung up with people constantly commenting about a couple of notes wrong in the score, you know, as if that were a big, 
horrible thing, right? You know, I'm aware, okay? I'm a one-man operation. I'm just a guy out here in New Zealand who loves improving people all over the world in their orchestration, and I'm giving this gift to you guys. And if there are one or two little mistakes in the template, well, you know, that just happens, right? I'm, I'm not the most perfect person in the world, which is pretty obvious from watching my videos. <laughs> Okay, so so no <clears throat> no offense really taken, but just let's focus on the on the things that are important. Okay, all right. Now here you throw in Atava, and it's really not necessary, even just for the score reader and for keeping things vertically um, uh, vertically from getting too big, because you're using a very small staff size here. Uh, this could have been upped even a little bit more. I think this might be, is it 4.5 or maybe you, maybe 5.1? That was my minimum. So if it's 5.1, then, then that's cool. But you still have room in here to score this out. And certainly the players don't need to read it Atava, right? So, so yeah, so I would just say avoid, avoid that when you have the space. Because look, look, right here you go all the way up to E, right? And so this D should be no big deal. Right, same thing here. You're going all the way up to E and D, so you don't need this Otava in here. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so thematic material, repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive. Eh, well, you know, I mean the charm of what you're doing, like the sheer charm, and you know, and introducing a few new elements, is enough. But I would say, possibly, if you are going to go further with this and you score it out a little bit more think about some variants maybe a little bit more variants right um and you know not enough to be a completely different arrangement but to maybe magnify what you are working on there all right so um melodic development soaring high that you know you, you basically deal with that scoring in octaves and um and I do like the support from below. I like the harmonization. Those are all really cool elements. As to accompaniment figures covering a wide range, you picked exactly the right instrument if you're going to drop it down there, uh, which is like bassoons can totally handle covering, you know, going from the going from the bass, like lower bass to middle bass to tenor register kind of pitches that they do that, you know, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in the normal case of scoring. So that's fine, too. <clears throat> it's a little... It's a little unorthodox. It just still needs a little bit more editing in terms of, like, who is playing when, right? This Like, sometimes you, you are careful about it. Like, here you say, first bassoon, right? But you should mark it again after five bars of rest so you know is this is this first bassoon second bassoon and then here you you i guess it's obviously first bassoon because you end here and then you have the second bassoon coming from under but then that doesn't necessarily mean that this is a second bassoon part to the copyist right so you would just want to write a two there to clarify or or have a um a bar rest in first voice above with the slur coming around the bottom to show that it was second voice on the notes right so Anyway, um, it's not a big deal, but it's just those little those little editing things that you need to watch out for. You're keeping it light. I mean, I, I appreciate that. You, you know, um, you have a lot of single wins rather than a two wins and so on, and and I think that that's cool. It just it is really going to have a chamber like sound. Now this is nicely scored right in here, just throwing in uh, trumpets and so on. And some horns. Now, now, which horns are playing what, right? So I think that you need to have um, a name in the middle, two horns in F, or excuse me, four horns in F. And then right in here, <clears throat> it's a, just a question of, like, which horns are playing what where, right? And, and whether or not it's better to have this split up into uh, first and third playing the top line and second playing the bottom. It's just that it goes a little bit low. Do you know what I mean? And then here you have a stack, which would normally be scored um, one, excuse me, one on top, 
and then three, and then two, and then four uh, to be harmonized, right? So, so if you're going to keep this the way that it looks, then you might want to say like um, just one and three up here and two and four down there, right? That's just a simple way of covering it. Though uh, eventually, like with an extended concert score, you really should go ahead and just score it out, um, even if it looks identical, because you've got first uh, the first playing this and the second playing this on the same staff, and then the same thing below with the third and the fourth. It's just better to do that, even though it takes up more space. It's just clearer to the copyist, clearer to the conductor, and everything else, rather than doing the one, three, two, four, which can also lead to uh, questionable decisions in the horn scoring long range, right, or long term. Okay, so sorry not to get sidetracked with minutia. Uh, and this is just really fun. The brass and the triangle playing together. So triangle is really not a very loud instrument. It's almost as soft in its way as the harp or the celesta, right? It's, so like here you're keeping the the dynamic down, mezzo forte, and I would say actually mark the triangle forte as you have here, okay? And that will that will make it a lot more audible. Now, I, I assume that these note heads are sort of floating here above the staff line because that way you are activating something in the sound set for this, uh, for this line. But I would say, like, in, in general, don't do that, right? Just have the, have the notes on the line. It's just much easier to read. <clears throat> so, I mean, just a question of a clapper. I mean, there are... There are like mechanical clappers. There's people actually clapping their hands. Um, there are electronic clappers, like you know, um, like the the sound that you used here really reminds me of the old Lin drum, which um, I'm a I am a very small time recording producer from uh, from the '80s, from the early '80s. And we use the Lin drum for all kinds of things. And this really sounds like that Lin drum sound, that really kind of very uh, artificial, too perfect clap. And it was funny how, like, how in the 1980s we just ran towards that artificial sound, right? You know, that, that, real, um, that real kind of dry, cut off uh, uh, kind of, you know. And then we were also, of course, experimenting with things like the cement room in which uh, Phil Collins plays the drum beat for uh, Peter Gabriel's Intruder that also has like a um, that also has a noise gate on it, right? So, so there's <laughs> like there were a lot of things that we were experimenting with, and a lot of things we took for granted, right? So, so this just reminds me; it just brings me back to the '80s when I hear that you know, bump, 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 you know that 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 kind of clapping thing. I'm also, of course. You know, it's it also reminds me, of course, of Spanish um, folk music and flamenco. Uh, Eddie Gonzalez shared a uh, shared a video <clears throat> about um, uh, you know sh that showed some flamenco dancing and singing and playing and so on. And uh, yeah, it's just really all one big art where everything is merged together and. Uh, yeah, so there's there can be some quick clapping. It's very it's very fast clapping though. You know, you'd have to have a have a like a back and forth motion uh, where the where the hands are sort of meeting in midair to kind of get this speed, right? Um, so yeah, so we're thinking mechanical clapper here. Um, so yeah, but I mean, look, castanets are probably the the right way to go if this becomes a more serious concert score. And, you know, maybe cutting down a little bit on so many glissandos, right? Um, I mean, these two are perfect, right? And, I mean, these these are fun, really good gestures, kind of, you know, adding some flavor and so on to the music. But, you know, just in a concert context, they might be a bit, a bit much. And this is all really nicely defined. So, you know, we're kind of solving some of these problems moving forward with our entrant our website entrant evaluation criteria, right? Um, talking about uh, accompany fig accompaniment figures, the, um, the, the height of the melodic development, 
and the um, upper middle register, um, you, you know, being a bit relentless, that's, that is addressed by the fact that, you know, there is some variation in the scope of the scoring and that, and that we have a completely different color now, uh, brass. And then maintaining the driving staccato. Well, you sh really should have marked staccato, at least on the first bar here, uh, of your arco strings. And, I mean, it's, it's inherent in the sound set that you used to, to play a row of eighth notes at this speed staccato, I guess. And then you have um, clarinets and flutes doubling some of those same pitches. So, th so that all works well. Um, I'm just going to point out like one or two things that uh, that have been said. What, what was that? The there was this one orchestration manual. I can't remember which author where he really recommended against contrasting sections, right? So, like you know, here you got winds, right, and then you switch to brass, and then you have strings and so on. So. Um, I feel that that doesn't apply to this particular scoring because you, you have a very clear picture of what you want to do and it isn't just like throwing in a new section for, you know, just because, you know, you just want to change sounds. You have some integrated parts, you know, like you've got some doubling here, celesta and winds, along with the strings. You've got some support from the strings with the winds and so on. So there isn't, really isn't a sense of total isolation of any... Uh, and any particular group. And I really do like the wonderful chamber wind sound that is happening here. I feel that that is a, a, a wonderfully integrated uh, kind of approach and it really makes the harp audible, right? Okay, so um, so those are my thoughts about this score, Jerry. Just really enjoyable and and you know just had a lot of life and a lot of color and, and so much fun and it's a really great way to start this uh, particular uh, this particular group of scores and and just I'm really looking forward to seeing what everybody thinks of the other scores as we as we go through them so let's not delay any longer I'm just going to go straight to the next evaluation now and thank you so much Jerry for contributing your entry to this challenge Right, and now for our second entry from Lara. Lara, it's great to get an entry from you, and it's wonderful how uh, subtle and and innovative that your sound picture is here. You really like it. it something there is something a little bit resonant with the previous entry in that both of your entries are not enormously scored right they're they're both kind of subtle and uh and they're kind of going for intrigue and color and so on and so forth it yeah it's just very um <laughs> very very fun okay so um just a couple little things i'm gonna i'm going to jump on in terms of like balance and things like that and 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 possible scoring like right here I think you could go Divisi uh, in two. Hang on. Just to do this the right way. It's kind of... Okay, if we change these to um, second voice. See, like, this is way, way easier. Rather than having each note being played by a separate player, which makes it a much softer effect. You want Fortissimo here, right? And you want this to all come through. Well, I think this is, you could possibly play this um, without, like, non divisi I think you're just playing kind of a high B octave. Uh, and then with the, with the E string um, open. 
I'm trying to, I'm sort of thinking about my imaginary fingerboard. Um, not, not, it wouldn't be the, the nicest thing, right? So, so Divisi, you have the open E and then you have the B on the A string and then you have the other players playing B on the E string. So anyway, so that's a, it's a possible way to deal with this. Um, now, uh, you know, I've talked a little bit before about harp getting overwhelmed by xylophone and so forth. So, so that is a um, that is a possible concern here. I mean, you've got you've got some things going on here, like the the cello is kind of supporting this E from below, you know, and then the A in in this natural harmonic and so on. So those kinds of things work fine. It's it's a little strange though that you go to um, you go to this D here, but um, you didn't have that same note in the in the harp, so maybe that's something to fix, or maybe you just wanted both different notes. I don't know. <clears throat> so um, yeah, and, and there's there's some dynamic balancing in here. You know, this part's mezzo forte, that's forte, and so on and so forth. So I I would say try not to you know try to just have some basic dynamics that aren't too um that aren't too tweaky you know that that aren't too fussy um and i think that that is kind of the way to go with this um you know to have a foreground dynamic and a middle ground or background dynamic right rather than having too many all at once now here you're using this sort of um this style of um you know, letting it letting it kind of hang, sort of you know these um, these unfinished ties, and in concert scoring, I think that that's completely not necessary. I think you should just if you want this to last for two beats, then just write in two beats, right? Same thing here, and this could be a dotted half note. You'll notice that I I really really edited the hell out of your score. You sent this to me in panorama panorama mode. I would say don't do that next time. Like, just send me the send me the score, like this. You know, if you possibly can, um, in in this uh, horizontal format, in landscape format. Edit it down. If there are any instruments you're not using, just delete them from the score, and then I can boost the staff size to a quite readable uh, proportion. Right. Um, okay. All right. So now let's focus on the criteria and on your scoring and everything else. And let's not worry, worry too much about all the fussy little things. All right. So pitch weight in the upper middle register of the orchestra. Once again, you know, you are spreading things out a little bit and adding some, um, some variety to the, uh, the sound picture. So I don't think it's as huge a concern. Uh, and you know you're you're using different approaches, right? So, so that counts for something. Um, and that also addresses the thematic re material repeating, uh, because you're you're not using the same approach, uh, copy pasting. And as far as the uh, melodic development soaring quite high, you're using xylophone and piccolo and so on, clarinet from below. And I mean, I, I I respect the you know the desire to balance this so that it is like really it is just the um, it's the overtones kind of softly underlining what is going on in uh, in piccolo and so on and so forth uh, rather than it the um, the clarinet really being all that audible for its own sake. However. <laughs> um, it you know it it just I just sort of feel that it it's getting a little a little too um, a little too fussy in terms of so many different dynamic markings um, different ones for different sets of instruments so maybe if there are some overall approaches then you know then it, then it might work better in practice right because you don't know like the the players don't know what the other players are playing right like if one player is sitting next to another player uh, and they can't really see their stand but one is playing mezzo forte and the other is playing forte and they're of the same instrument they're of the same section of instruments 
they might think, oh, wow, that's a pretty strong, you know, that's a pretty strong mezzo forte that this guy is playing. So uh, maybe I should just be a little louder, right? And I mean, and it's kind of rare that you see like a melodic instrument marked mezzo forte and the accompanying instrument marked forte, right? So that there can be a danger there that the that the uh, accompaniment actually really does play louder than the melody, even when it's pizzicato, a, a kind of articulation style you think would not dominate, right? So you got to watch out for some of these things. Um, maybe that works in the mock-up, but maybe not in the in in real life, right? Um, you you know here too, like I I sort of didn't really complete a thought previously about a xylophone absorbing harp. You know I I think that this is still possible to balance. I would mark these uh, as tenuto, right? And then you've you've got the support from the cello as I mentioned before. All right, so just make sure that you've got those sounds working together. And I think that you have got, and then, you, you know, of course, also the viola, right? Um, maybe if the viola is um, non-vibrato, right, then you can have that kind of cool sound below. All right. Um, so coming in here with these trumpets, bramp, 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 and you've sort of written in the written out the grace notes, uh, and that's fine. I I really love the way that you're using horn, just like just that wonderful little color. It's a bit, you know, I I don't think you really need to score this, um, a two, right? I I think that this is you know this is that uh, it's just a bit big. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's that much weight is really going to push through uh, quite a bit. And, and if, if that's still the approach right here, then you know, it might be better just to have two horns playing this. And I would say the first and the second, right? It's, I mean, you are, you're pushing the low player up that high anyways, right? So a low player can play a G with no problem and an F. I mean, they could play all the way up to high C all the time, right? It's just... Um, it's better to partner them with the first, right? So I would say just get rid of your second and fourth horns here and then have have these be played by um, just by single players rather than doubled players. Um, so this works really nice. The contrast between the, you know, bium, 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 and then flute and oboe, bum, 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 bum. That's really nice. And then you're kind of taking things in a different direction here with flute and clarinet and xylophone. Just such a great idea. Just wonderful timbral decisions. Um, there definitely will be a falling off here in in the in the effect, right? So you have to you know you have to be just be aware that there's no way to compensate for the loss of the strings um, from this. Uh, from the texture of the melody, right? So I mean, so if you make that decision, then just it'll it really is going to make a difference in in practice. And then you know here you're shifting this part to your upper winds, and that's kind of nice because it is a contrast. You, there's no there's no xylophone, right? And there's no clarinet and piccolo. So it's a it is really a new texture that you're bringing in here, a new timbre. And then that's alternated with uh, Divisi violins. Look, there's there's absolutely no reason why the viola couldn't be helping out right here. like, And so that you don't have to have such a severe Divisi, right? You could have the uh, second violins playing a D fifth here, and then you could have the, uh, the violas playing a C third. Right or uh, sorry, a C fourth. I meant to say, and then it's you know it, it isn't spreading out the sound so much, right? That it's like the like I I have a tendency to disregard huge concerns over whether or not um, whether or not Divisi is going to be strong enough, but I, I think that. In a situation where you are playing fortissimo, and you're dividing things into four different voices, 
I think it's better to just spread out the uh, the rolls between the parts. It might even be good to divide it in a different way, to have. Um, I would say try this: have the the divisi for the first bilans be the top line and this a. And then for the seconds, be the lower line and this uh, D, right? And then have the violas play C and F. And I think that that spreads things over across the strings a lot better. So just continuing on that same approach, same suggestions. And then we have a return of that previous approach with a few little added things, which is fine, you're setting this up. And <clears throat> right in here, this is about the only place where I would say a little bit of concern about that um, criterion of the upper middle register continuing on and it being a little resent relentless if there's no textural contrast. Well, there is a textural contrast, but there isn't as much relief of re of orchestral scope, right? So here's where I would say broaden things out a little bit, right? I mean, and you eventually do get to some lower notes right in here, but still it's, you know, it, it gets to be a bit trebly, you know, after so many bars. So I like the use of trumpet here as a support instrument. Um, here, yeah, I mean, you know, and once again, I mean, it's like half arc go, half pizzicato, that's all good, but these big chords, right? I mean, where where are the rest of our strings? Why can't this lower voice right in here, and including this F here, be played by violas and then the remaining notes, or or maybe even just even played by cellos, right? And then just have the, then just go to pizzicato here on this F. So cello on that, even playing this C, and then uh, viola taking these thirds right in here, and then the rest between um, going between violins and viol first first violin and second violin. Also, you have to tell us when this is coming to an end. Like the players will assume that it is right here. But yeah, I mean it's just a big that is a big quadruple stop to play. Very you know, very close together, very awkward fingering. I'm, I'm not even sure that that's possible. I'm sort of trying to turn on my internal fingerboard and think about how I would finger that. And my brain is just too lazy this morning to work it out on the spot. And then here, Divisi 2 only. So, yeah, and then here you come back to half arco and half pizzicato. So you have to, like here, just say ORD period for ordinario or a norm. Of I actually prefer because it's more universal to languages um, so, yeah, um, yeah, so, so I would say keeping this in the background is not a bad idea. The, the trumpets are going to be pretty bright here, right? Um, so I think you want your winds and your, your strings and your winds to be working together in terms of a foreground type of, of dynamic. And then the, the brass here to be just a little bit a little bit in the background. So a mezzo forte on a high G for first horn is, is okay. It's fine. Um, but yeah, but it's more realistic forte and so on. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and then it's kind of strange. Second clarinet on the upper part and then first clarinet. I would actually switch these. Don't worry about the fact that this is a more lively part, okay? It's more of a second clarinet part right in here. And then, yeah, English horn and bassoon. Can't go wrong. That is very, very fun. Yeah, that, that works really, really nice. And, yeah, and then throwing in just a teeny bit of trombone. This, you know, in a situation like this where the trombone gets three notes, you might want to just do that with bassoon, right? Um, just have the bassoonist continue on. Um, yeah. Yeah, and just look, I mean, 
score a score a d fifth that is a dotted half note here, right? You you don't really need these unfinished ties. Yeah. So, so you know, my impression of the score is very favorable. I, I really enjoyed it a lot, Lara. I think you've got a lot of really cool things happening. I think I think things more or less balance. Just, you know, try to think in terms of the groups of instruments working together at certain dynamic levels and, and then balancing the groups, right? Um, with different dynamics, if necessary, especially in a more delicate texture with the brass. Trust your your other string players to fill in in parts, um, you know, when you have a, some very ambitious harmonies planned for certain groups. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having your first violins playing arco and your second violins playing the same notes pizzicato, right? And just having the whole section and giving a lot more energy to that as it's uh, being doubled by clarinets and so on and, and uh, from above by xylophone and piccolo, right? So anyway, so great score, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your entry, hugely appreciated. And now let's just go straight to the next entry, which is also quite thought provoking. That is a very fun, very lively approach from Bosco. I really, really enjoyed this. Um, you know, not necessarily listening to that mock-up, but just looking at the score and and piecing together how it would sound with a real orchestra. So, if you want things to sound more realistic, then definitely try out Note Performer. Uh, I mean, you can just really hear. Um, you know the the very organ like approach when you when you score things like this and you have it played in the mock up you know it just really has that it just really sounds like a a big you know one of those big triple manual quadruple manual church organs and you know where all of the um all of the overtones from above track each other right you know you just really you just hear that very strongly and of course you're going to get that with parallel motion to a degree with us uh, with real concert instruments but yeah um, but still it's not going to be quite as as artificial sounding okay all right so let's just go straight to the uh, to the criteria I don't want to make this too sprawling of a video the last video was almost two hours long and I get the feeling this will be the same and more if I don't rein it in a little bit so um, <laughs> Yeah, so this is, this, like I said before, it's just really, really fun. There are a few misperceptions about, uh, about balance, uh, about what instruments are capable of balancing against others, right? So there is a great deal of, uh, of, of marimba in here. There's harp in here doing kind of complex arpeggiation and so on. And... These instruments are just really not audible in big tutti scoring like this, right? So the and and here's another thing, Bosco, you you need to think about how you are balancing things dynamically. You are giving weak instruments weaker uh, weaker dynamics than strong instruments, so they will be doubly invisible, right? They you have this, you know, bium, 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 forte, right? And then for some, for some strange reason, you go to forte here instead of fortissimo, right? So you've got fortissimo, then you go to forte, right? When these instruments come in and then, you know, you're making the top louder than the bottom. You just make everything fortissimo. It will balance, okay? Trust the, trust the section to, 
to play this correctly. This is kind of funny, these um, these seconds right in here. That's very, very fun. But I would say don't make your strings go weak right when the winds come in. I, I, I think I think you are trying to have this dovetail, right? But it will dovetail fine at, forte, at fortissimo. Don't worry about that. What you should be worried about is that marimba really cannot compete. Even if you were to score marimba at fortissimo here, the marimba could not, um, could really, it, it just gets absorbed into the sound of the rest of the orchestra. Uh, there is a, an, a tip on orchestrationonline.com that talks about the uh, spectrum, like the comparing the spectrum of a, the harmonic spectrum of a marimba to a xylophone and why is a xylophone so much stronger. And the reason why is that the overtones of a xylophone are very similar to that of a clarinet, um, you know, favoring the odd partials rather than the um, just like the full spectrum of partials and that that change in itself is just enough to swallow up the marimba right and then of course the harp is a very delicate instrument if you you've marked the harp forte against this big uh, fortissimo marcato right and and for some strange reason the 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 strings are are forte rather than fortissimo right so they should they are going to disappear as well, right? Against the bassoons and everything else going on, or they're just going to be very hard to hear. So I would say try to try to make try to have more unified dynamics. And and then right in here you have harp playing against pizzicato, which will be swallowed anyways, and you have it marked down to mezzo forte, right? So so just be aware of the um, of some instruments being kind of weaker and so on and 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 to try not to bury them in the in the sound picture okay um so let's not worry about that too much let's talk about the evaluation criteria that are posted at the beginning of this video uh pitch weight in the upper metal register of the piano sticking around for too long that's not a concern you have a bigger spread um a bigger scope to your scoring. Uh, thematic material repeating often, that's a different situation. See, just looking at this first entrance right in here and this second, we can kind of see that it's a little bit bigger, right? And, but, but generally speaking, it is kind of the same, right? It's, we have the we have the strings and then we have the reaction right and so there there isn't a significantly bigger kind of sound picture except for like just maybe adding cellos and double basses maybe if there were some support from timpani right or some maybe like heavy brass or something like that that's something that i did then it would be a little bit more differentiated, like the two sections would have more of a difference between them. Now, here we also have like a similar approach starting off, but I like the fact that you are changing it around with the um, measured tremolo here in the strings and so on. Uh, now, you, you probably sort of noticed there's a, there's a kind of a static feeling right in here, right? This is all very nimble scoring. Everything is very nimble except the horns and the bassoons and bass clarinets have this pad going on. And the pad is marked piano, right? You want to keep it, you're trying to keep it in the background, but it, it has a way of kind of bogging down or, or it, uh, making, the, making things inert, right? It, there, it adds some inertia to the activity that's going on here. Yes, you can add background harmony and so on, but like if you want to do it very softly in a way that doesn't interfere with the energy, then probably the instruments for that would be like clarinet and flute, like uh, low flute and clarinet, and just very, very softly in the background, or maybe strings, like maybe violas and second violins would be the right instruments to do that. Like right here, you've got instruments that are um, quite, uh, they really fill in the sound even when they're playing soft. And then if we go to the next page, we see that like that continues on, and then you've also got it right in here. So in both of those places, I feel that the energy is is really getting kind of dragged down, um, and is is kind of working against all the other energy with which you're scoring. 
Okay. Um, so we also have the whole issue of melodic development going fairly high. You are kind of getting around that a little bit. Keeping the melody just in the flutes, you know, first flute even, and then right at the end you have this massive crashing um, chordal melody right in here. And, it, you know, does that balance in terms of proportion, right? Is, is that something that um, that you know forms kind of a um, like a, a smooth conception of the idea or or do you just really like this kind of um, almost cubistic um, splashing of colors and and contrasting them and crashing them into each other um, you, you, know, you just have to make that decision whether or not that is going with the spirit of the music um, and that's personal for everyone. I'm not going to judge you on your sense of taste and and so on, but just just judge whether or not the proportions are are you know kind of working together. I really love the castanet, and I think the castanet sound is pretty good um, in your sound set as well. All right, now. Here we get into this kind of broken octave marimba playing, you know, diddle, 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 and I mean it is possible, but what's probably not possible, I mean it's it, it is tricky and will take a lot of of practice. But what is not possible is how you are heading with these broken octaves to this E octave here in this staff, and then this C octave there. So marimbas are really big instruments. Okay, they the you know to play a C octave in one hand and an E octave in the other hand this far apart. You know we're talking about the spread of a of you know you know some distance here. It's it's a much wider spread than that that is on the piano, and so you you've asked the player to play something very tricky. It just really requires a lot of focus and skill to play this, and then you're having their them jump suddenly down here. To play this and hit this octave, so that's just—I mean—that is virtuosic marimba playing. You know, if it weren't for the fact that nobody was, is going to be able to hear their ingenuity because the marimba is such a soft instrument compared to everybody else, and you've marked it piano crescendo to fortissimo, while you're starting at forte crescendo in all of these other instruments, right? So nobody is going to hear that marimba just just who just practiced their heart out to try to get this right for you and you know even though and they might be asking you hey can I leave that D off off right in here and you might say no no you could just 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 work through it you know so really you know be aware of the technical demands that you're asking of your players especially like when you score something for an unfamiliar instrument like this right all right um, aside from that I really do like how the big scoring right in here provides a solution to the upper middle register being a bit relentless if everything is kind of the same timbre and the same register. Um, it's it's a very kind of scrubbing sound. So I'm noticing that that is that um, you know that the the little um, FC 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 thing going on in the in the piano part left hand. Is being transcribed into these just massive bum 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 kinds of um, gestures for lower instruments. So you just you know, it really does kind of like remind me of somebody kind of scrubbing, a, you know, like a on, on one of those old washboards, right? It just really has that <laughs> kind of a sound. So just be aware of that kind of just real sort of violent back and forth grinding sound that is going to result. Um, uh, I do like the castanets though, that's kind of cool, and the tambourine. That's all very much in the style. Uh, however, see, you have all this weight on your lower register right in here, and then, like, you have a little bit in the middle here, but you just really have almost no support for your strings up here, right? Right, right here is where you need those flutes and those oboes and per perhaps even the clarinets to be doubling and filling in and so on. 
because the the strength of the brass and the kind of brutality of this lower scoring is going to sort of just really drown out anything that the strings are doing right in here. You'll still hear them, but they just won't have much of a punch, right? This is nice though. <laughs> Yeah. And then Molto Mercato with the Pizzicato. See, that all works pretty good. But once again, the um, the pad in here, uh, the choice of instruments, especially the very low contrabassoon, is is just really kind of pulling down the energy of the, you know, it's, it's, it's just kind of making things very solid rather than, than bouncy, right? It, you know, it's sort of, it's kind of like everybody having a big dance, you know, like they're all dancing around and they're all having fun. And then there are like a few big, really big guys just kind of sitting there in the middle of the dance floor and not doing anything, right? That's kind of what this feels like a little bit, just to sort of bring in some imagery, right? So just consider what that does to the to the liveliness of the score. This is kind of great, though. I just... I like what's going on here, flutes and oboes above. See, that doesn't pull the energy down as much. All right, and then you're showing us how this is leading into this, and that that's nice. You know, adding a bar or two of the next section is, is, is not a problem because that's showing me how you're transitioning to the next passage, and you do a smoother transition, right? And this is all nicely scored right in here. Really enjoyed that a lot. There are a few things that... I would want to take apart and discuss, but, but yeah, but generally speaking, this I don't have as many problems with what follows as um, some of the previous two T scoring, right? So, I would just say, like, as a general piece of advice, is to study more two Ts, right? And just like um, two T scoring, scoring where everybody is playing or practically everybody is playing it at once, I feel is actually a lot simpler than it's often made out to be, but there is definitely a certain principle behind that simplicity. So I, I would just say, look, study it a lot more. Um, you know, look at big pages from Stravinsky and, um, you know, and uh, Dvorak and Wagner and, uh, and Rachmaninoff and uh, Ludoslavsky and like, you know, just like every every big score you can get your hand on, just really look and see how they have realized massive textures and like why do they work? Always ask yourself that and diagram out those chords, right? And check out some of my own uh, my own videos on two T two T chords. I think that that will help a lot as well. All right, so so you know once again as I was as I said before thought provoking and just really gave me a lot to dig into and to talk about and to try to help you with okay so uh, please consider entering next year's orchestration challenge because it would be very cool to see you try out that score which is going to be completely different from uh, from this FIA challenge different in many many different many individual ways um, and will maybe provide a completely new challenge for you to attempt and that goes out to everybody on this you know all everybody watching this video who is participating this year including the people on <laughs> on the video who video whose entries I'm evaluating all right so now let's just keep right on rolling I'm I always feel like I'm on a roll when I'm doing these website uh, um, entry evaluations. So let's just keep rolling right along. now for Roy's entry and just apologies for the um, for the uh, microphone noise in the previous entry sorry that just sort of crept in and I uh, did not 
notice it until I took a look at it. Um, and you're lucky that I caught it, but it just, you know, I, I know that's just really annoying and I, I apologize for that, but um, I'm kind of afraid to do that evaluation again. I thought that the feedback that I gave to Bosco was was perfect and it didn't really, you know, I, I just don't, and, and, I, and I actually kind of don't have time to repeat that today. So please bear with me. I apologize for the... Um, for the technical difficulties, and you know, at least it is audible, right? The 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 voice track. So sorry about that. Okay, so let's jump into this evaluation here. Um, just a few thoughts about scoring in general before I jump into the evaluation criteria and just and some other thoughts of on texture balance and function. Um, I think that the Sforzando marking just becomes a little um, a little too cluttered, uh, and you know it, it's the kind of thing where the brain just starts to turn it off. You know, like sort of like black dots on a white field, and the brain just starts to erase them. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's better just to use the accent mark uh, if you mean accents, right? And, and I know that there are. Some people who feel that a sforzando is a different kind of an accent, but in this regard, it, it is just ex doing exactly the same work as the standard accent. So I think you should just really mark it as such. Um, the other thing I'm going to, uh, other comment I'm going to make as sort of a general observation is that this scoring is just really dynamic and exciting, and it really works. However, the brass are just so strong, and and I I see that you are taming them to a certain degree, bringing down the volume, but you're also bringing down the volume of other instruments, right? Like the the English horn right in here and the bassoons. So um, I think that it might be a better approach just in general to have the brass right in here forte with accents and having everybody else fortissimo with accents. Like there isn't even a kind of a dynamic marked because there's so much sforzando, right? So it would be better to define what is the overall dynamic for the passage, fortissimo, and then you don't have to mention it later, right? And just kind of, I would just say, sort of stick with that, right? Now, I understand why you are marking down your English horn and your bassoons right in here. It's because you want, uh, you want them to work seamlessly with your horns and you're kind of marking it down mezzo forte and you kind of want it all to work together. And, and, and I respect that. Okay, and it is just such a great idea, and I love the way that you have it orchestrated right in here. But I, I think that, like, kind of a general rethink of the dynamics and the accents and everything else, and you may be marking things a little bit differently. Uh, I feel that the, the correct dynamic here is not an accent, but a tenuto mark, right? Because you just want a full, blocky note. You know, bum, bum. You know, you just really want that. Sorry about my tuneless singing, but you just really want that. Um, you want that real, just, um, you know, note that just starts right on it, like not a spike and then letting down in a shaped note. You want a note that is shaped like a square, right? Um, so, yeah. All right. Um, there were some questions about. Um, from I think you sent me like a, a little text note about flutter tonguing, so that that was included in my sound set, but you probably heard it didn't really come through that much, and that's just because the brass are so strong right in here. They're they're really kind of blotting out everything, especially you know you've got these high G's, right? Um, so high on the in your your C trumpets, going all the way up to A, and that just really kind of kills a lot of the subtler things that you're trying to do in here. So. Um, I'm not saying that it's wrong to, to score your trumpets that high, uh, although you could have them do the work scoring lower and then just using the overtones to fill in and support the winds, right? That's another idea of how you could have scored this. Uh, however, it's a specific color that you want to go for, and I understand that and respect that. Um, it's just, yeah, I feel that the whole, you know, Sforzando scoring and, and maybe using even just using accents at all, right? You know, you might be able to get away with just scoring forte 
without all the accents in the Sforzando and then just getting the right support and balance. But you know, right the way that it is now in the mock-up and in my mind, just looking at this, is the brass are just really strong and they are taking over, like their overtones are taking over the what the strings and the winds are trying to do. It, it's very, very sparsely scored in terms of strings, right? It's just really kind of feels more like a... Um, almost like a brass band piece at the beginning, with just like a little bit of commentary by the strings. They don't really come into their own until later, right? So, I mean, if you're more experienced with scoring brass and winds, it's understandable, but I just, just feel that, you know, there's... It's not like it's sort of missing, but they're, the you know, the full color of the orchestra is not quite present at all times um, in this big 2 scoring. Um... Yeah, I mean, you can kind of see that these rips uh, also get swallowed. I mean, they should be bright and beautiful and pushing into the texture so wonderfully. And and yet the, the, the huge sound, especially, you know, these high G-sharps and trumpet and so on, are just really kind of swallowing the, even for piccolo, they're kind of pushing that out of the sound picture. I do think it's wise the way that you have scored just like eighth notes, Right, you know, just like really getting out of the way of the of the continuation of the melody. You know that's all right, but like, you know, here's here's another question of balance, right? You have second oboe playing this right in here, this G sharp. By the way, that should be F double sharp going to G sharp. Don't simplify things, right? Just you know, make it um, make it something that is that really you know, is functionally correct. And don't worry about the player not being able to read it. They'll understand it. You know, they might joke about it and say, oh boy, F double sharp. But if they are, if they are any kind of professional, they're just going to play it and not worry about it and know what to do, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so, all right, so, but back to this, like the F double sharp should be going to the G sharp, um, you know, you've got the, that G sharp being played by first trumpet. So it is really going to kind of take over the sound. The, the second oboe really isn't contributing very much to this at all, right? And then you've got your English horn being doubled by the second trumpet. And, and so there's the English horn is adding a little tone wave. But, you know, if, if these instruments were marked fortissimo, and your trumpets were marked forte, it would still be dominant of trumpet, but there would be a chance of these wind instruments of contributing something to the sound. Okay, uh, but, you know, I mean, I love the whole idea here. You're very, very careful about marking your plus sign over the stopped pitches, but not very careful about marking the, um, the circle, showing that things are going back to open in the um, in your horns, so like if you're going to use so many, you know, you're going to mark your your stopped notes conscientiously. That is great, but then continue on and be conscientious about letting the player know that the stopped notes are coming to an end with a little circle. Okay. Now, in terms of balance, right in here, this is all kind of fun. Um, these big bright notes like kind of pushing out of the texture is kind of beep you know it's a little problematic for me i mean you're going boop, boop, beep um i'm not so sure that that i mean it's playable for any any flute player should be able to play that but i'm just not sure how musical it is right you know like there's some notes that are at at extremes of register um you know that they're playable but they're not musical right and so like it it sometimes it breaks the heart of the player to have to play it, right? It's not that they can't do a high D, <laughs> right? But it's just that they're kind of thinking, ah, you know, do I want to do that? Um, you know, or do I want to do that after a leap, right? Um, you know, a note that's perfectly playable, but it's just still, you know, is it, you know, is it all that, um, you know, does it, does it really serve the function that you think when it could be played, you know, maybe, maybe what you're thinking there could be played by a note by glockenspiel or by, um, you know, you get a similar to the same effect with, you know, using a percussion instrument or some other kind of thing. All 
All right. <laughs> okay, so back to our criteria. I'm getting a little distracted from them. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting the way that the um, the way that you kind of got around some of the challenges in the melody soaring very high. And, you know, I, I felt that there was a nice flow and continuity, even kind of going up to this high E with all, all of the jumps down and so on and compromises. I, I thought that that was pretty well scored. Um, it, it's a little fiddly, you know, the kind of interjecting parts of the uh, parts of the accompaniment into the, uh, you know, directly into the range or the register of the higher melody um, you know, the higher melod melodic functions, right? But, I mean, you've got so much weight with the glockenspiel and the strings and, and so on and, and the overtones coming from the uh, first trumpet below. And, uh, you know, I mean, it does kind of work. And I really like the horns coming in, in here and pushing, right? So thinking about our... our um, our criteria, just just kind of strictly speaking, there's not a big concern about the pitch weight imitating the piano score and being too limited to the upper middle register. The thematic material is a bit of copy paste right in here, uh, you, you know. So I would say like maybe that's something you might want to work on. Maybe add more strings in here and maybe some timpani, right? Or or more bass trombone or or add some tuba, right? Just like kind of beef up the lower register in here. But I mean, I, I see why you're holding off on the lower register scoring because you want that to be more effective um, for you know for what's going on and the horns and so on uh, and the bassoons and and bass trombone. So so I, I'm I'm not saying you have to do that, but it's just a thought. Um, we talked about the melodic development, uh, the accompaniment figures covering a wide range. I feel that they start to kind of interfere, like I mentioned before, right? They get very, very high. The flute, like, jumping up to those very high notes. Uh, and, like, maybe more could be done with the um, the second clarinet. Uh, maybe the oboes. Uh, you know, maybe trombones working together with... Uh, with a more developed accompaniment style happening in the strings in your pizzicato strings, right? Rather than pushing the accompaniment figures so high into the into the pathway of the of the melody. Now, the upper middle register continuing on and being relentless that is not a uh, not a big concern. Uh, maybe you know, just in terms of proportions, maybe it gets to be a bit much, just this continuous, like, upward pushing flurry in all the instruments. Um, it, you know, just like, I mean, you I think you've made your point several times, right? Five times. So do you want to keep doing that, right? So it it, it doesn't really hurt the music. And I, I think it's kind of fun. But just, you know, if you, you know, you're obviously you have, you're scoring this with an eye to perfection. So, you know, is... Just it's just a question to ask rather than a criticism, you know. Is do you want to to continue that? Do you want to vary the the approach in there with the you know? Is is there some percussion instrument or some string approach or some other kind of thing that could add to it to make it not quite as repetitive of what happened before? Now this is all very fun right in here. You know, you've got your flutes and octaves. You are thinking about getting too low, and and you actually do kind of get a little bit too low, right? It just it'll it'll just get swallowed into the string texture. So the the place to go, a two is right here rather than right here, and then maybe have oboes come in and support that middle or or clarinet. Um, I, I really love the idea of the E flat clarinet in here, by the way, and you know supporting that high B, and you really kind of do need that support. When you consider that all you've got is just the, um, you've got the first oboe and you've got the uh, E flat clarinet hitting that high B, and and you know and then like the the trumpets just being so full beneath it, 
will just kind of even even compete with that. So to have such a forceful little instrument right in there, um, that helps a lot. But you just really do have to worry about whether or not the E flat clarinet is going to dominate, right? Um, is is it you know, or or is it a something that could be used on its own? It, it sort of seems like a pity that. The orchestration is just so full in here, and there's kind of no there's no place for the E flat clarinet to do anything all that um, uh, all that exposed or exhibitionist. You know, there's something there's a sort of an ex exhibitionistic quality about the E flat clarinet uh, when it gets a solo. You know, it's kind of like a um, you know a little kid running down the street. Uh, in their diaper or something like that, you know, kind of waving a uh, um, waving something over their head and screaming. So you know, it's kind of has that quality um, is to it. So so you know, you you have to sometimes you have to rein it in a little bit. Um, but that's I mean, it's not a big concern. It's just a just maybe you know, it's a resource that was used well in the tutti and and then its other function is, you know, wh what if the what if the E flat clarinet were the top voice right in here with like English horn below, right? Or some other kind of interesting color rather than just the flutes, right? That they're and as a way of, of making this more punchy, right? Because you still, you know, you want that kind of flute tone on top, right? But then the next question is whether or not the marcato strength of the strings is going to swallow the sound of the first flute up here, and it wouldn't do it if the flutes were a two, right? And it wouldn't do it if that were that was an E flat clarinet on top. But uh, I have a tip about this in 100 more orchestration tips, and it's just as as how strong strings have a tendency to swallow the sound of flute tracking at an octave above. Now, now of course, the flute player can play out and can um, can combat that, but in some scores they shouldn't, like in some Mozart and and um and beethoven scores haydn the flute is supposed to just play the um it's just is supposed to play the the overtone right or the or this sort of sort of fill in the space above without necessarily being an instrument that is heard on its own right right so that is kind of the effect that you're heading for here but it's going to be a little unnatural when it becomes a two and it, it's more prominent Right, so that's another reason why I thought, oh, you know, E flat clarinet in there, right? Maybe as the top voice, so that it's just very, very clear that there is a wind instrument on top, and it's also just that naughty little kid running down the street, um, waving a firecracker or whatever. So, um, yeah. Anyways, so so just think about a lot of those, um, a lot of those things. I like the push right in here from the snare drum. It's kind of fun, you know. I like the sort of the cantina band um, percussion laying down some rhythms in here. I think that that's a that is a cool approach that doesn't, you know, you you've scored it in such a way that it doesn't become tiresome, right? So, um, so nicely done. So, anyway, so th those are the thoughts that I had about it. Maybe um, maybe you can cut back a little bit on Glockenspiel here and there, um, but yeah. But otherwise, just a really nice, satisfying score. Just enjoyed enjoyed listening to it, enjoyed talking about it. It was really nice. And, you know, just to reiterate, just it would makes me very curious to see what you will do with next year's entry if you enter. Right? So um, so thanks again, and now on to the next score. So now we've got uh, Sasha Kindel's score, and really, really enjoyable. Um, there, I, I like the restraint. You know, once again, this is this is of a piece with the first two entries that were smaller scale, right? Um, 
almost like chamber orchestra scoring. Well, I mean, let's be honest about it. This is a chamber orchestra. I feel that this is a situation, Sasha, where you should provide an alternate part for, say, English horn or another standard instrument. Just so that this would be playable by a, uh, an orchestra. Now, recently in the group, there was a discussion about saxophones. You know, do you think saxophones should be used in the orchestra? Or what are your thoughts about that? And so on. And I had to talk about, talk a little bit about whether, you know, like whether or not scoring a saxophone would get your score not looked at by an orchestra, right? Because sometimes people are looking for just any reason. <laughs> you know, they don't want to be bothered. Uh, in in my case, um, the person who was sharing the score with the orchestra was somebody that they, you know, they were interested in her. <laughs> they were interested in the fact that I was a family member of hers, and she was a very influential on a certain council, and she was involved with the arts, and they liked my score, but they couldn't use it because it had two saxophones. And if I had just scored one of the saxophone parts as an English horn part and the other saxophone part as a third bassoon part, then I would have had a premiere in uh, Germany, right? Pretty much that was the that was the message that I got, and I didn't get it, you know. But they, but I mean, they didn't say hey, rescore this for these two instruments. They just said, look, we can't do it because we can't, we don't have access, uh, access to, um, to, you know, I, I think it was a question of budget and it was a question of access to the right kind of players, right? So for, you know, for two alto saxophone players. So they just passed on it um, and that was enough of an excuse, right? So, so you know, not to get too far into that. And there, there was another situation where I had like um, a, group of saxophones in a larger piece and that also got turned down by a fairly big orchestra so um the the point is just like it it's great that you are writing this sort of involved soprano saxophone part and giving it a lot of responsibility that's that's fantastic um i would just say like supply something that is similar in timbre and um and is more available right and then your score will have more legs and obviously you know maybe not in this situation although you scored out this entire piece and that's commendable and i wish i had a chance you know i wish i had the ability to evaluate the whole thing however um it's it, you know, it it's a it's a chamber work, and it could be played by a very small group of people, right? You know, just like um, six winds and brass, one tambourine player, and you know, maybe like a a dozen string players, and that's um, less than twenty people, right? Okay, so it, it's just a matter of how you're using your resources too, right? Now here you've got this. You got this nice sort of wind and brass scoring right in here, and I, I like what you're doing with the D trumpet. Uh, you know, you got your muted trumpet, you got your stopped horn, right? Um, and you know, the it just seems to me like this just does not feel strong enough. the The violins are they're not only not strong enough; they're not in a register where um, where they really have that much to compete with the um, with the winds and brass. So uh, the answer is that they have to be very direct, right? They have to have a very direct sound, a very penetrating, pushing sound. And the way that you get that in this kind of combination is to double them up, triple them up, right? Now, you could achieve that in a few different ways. You could have your second violins just doubling this arco and then switching to pizzicato. That's no problem. Just like just to get these Bs to come through. Um, and then there's the uh, you know possibility of using the violas on those that same thing. It gives it a different, a slightly different color, a slightly you know kind of a chestier color, and that might actually work really, really well, considering that you're sort of competing with horns and trumpets and and everything else. Okay, so. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I feel like in terms of like it being kind of a simple score, a simpler score, in, you know, in terms of the, the sound picture, the breadth of the sound picture, not simple in terms of, of your approach by any means. Um, it, there, it's kind of less relevant to hold the evaluation criteria to this, you know, sort of put its feet to the fire and say, you know, like, are you doing, you know, are you thinking about all these things as much, right? Certainly with a smaller sound picture and keeping the pitch weight in the upper middle register, just like the piano, upper middle register of the orchestra, you know, you do get that sort of brighter sound and you don't really go all that low with the cello scoring right in here. And it becomes even more simplistic in a, in a way, like right in here with like the viola and everything else. Right. But the bassoon is nice. That adds a little bit more weight, um, even though it does kind of pull a little bit at the energy, as I was mentioning in a previous score. But I do like the, you know, the, th the way that you throw in some variety right it's just so it isn't it, it isn't a complete carbon copy right it really you did make some changes and there's more of a role right here for your um for your lower strings I, you know i mean it's it's i i kind of feel like it's not as complete as it could be right there there are ways of strengthening certain parts like pizzicato cellos right in here could have been doubled by bassoon um in a smaller scale score like this like the the if you want to sound more orchestral have more doublings if you want to sound more chamber then have less doublings and have each voice be more unique right and that is kind of the approach that you're taking here it's more of a chamber work you know it's like um kind of like uh like a, a 12 part it really, it really is kind of working more with 12 parts rather than having that many doublings. I mean, like here you're doubling pizzicato and arco in your second violins. Here you're doubling at the octave with your um, saxophone and your violins, right? So, you know, some of these parts can work together in strings and winds and be fuller right but with a more chamber like sound then it, it is a very open sound and it has a kind of a, a more intimate see i don't want to say weaker because that's not true at all um like the the huge power you know who could say that death and the maiden the death and the maiden quartet by schubert is a weak work not at all it's just that the force of the of each sound is very intimate and close to you, right? So that is kind of what is going on with this score. I like the, I like, you know, how you're bringing out these sounding bees, you know, ba, 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 da, 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 ba, ba. it's kind of nice. I think a tenuto mark wouldn't be out of place right in there. Okay, and then, yeah, a little tremolo from the viola. So it's, yeah, it's just very, you know, it's very downscaled scoring. It's um, let's take a look at the next page. And here, you know, I mean, you, you went to this huge effort of scoring out the entire piece. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that you have to, um, you have to be a, a Patreon supporter at a higher level or anything like that to, um, for it to be worth your while. I mean, obviously you get, you get a huge amount of satisfaction out of scoring everything out all the way through. And that's great. But, you know, um, it just remains for me to feel regretful that I don't have the time to look at at these scores where people have, you know, people are entering just so that I can talk about the beginning of the piece. And and I just, you know, sadly have less and less time as more and more people enter. Um, and I, you know, I just feel that kind of sense of regret every time I see something that's really been well worked out, you know, especially, you know, pieces like this or, or the score before... Um, you know, some of the scores before where people had had sent me just beautiful section Bs, you know, uh, that I can't evaluate really. But, all right, so, so here we're getting into that same place where I've talked about upper middle register continuing on. And, and here I, I do feel that there is a bit of a critique, you know what I mean? Just a, a possible... 
point that you could develop things out, right? There, there's nothing wrong with having lower instruments come in here and fill in the sound picture so that you have some relief from the ear of so much, uh, so much upper middle register scoring, right? See, like here you're getting, you know, you're getting more active with the scoring, and I, I just feel like it just, you know, you need to, you need to take more chances and 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 think more fully, right? Just like to fill things out a little bit when you have an opportunity like this. Um, now, obviously, this is out of balance right in here. You, you know, if you have a horn player and a trumpet player pushing towards a fortissimo right in here then the soprano sax and the string players are just going to disappear, right? So I think it would be better to have like pianissimo to forte, right? And I think that that would be, that would be better balanced across all these instruments. There's no need to bring the soprano saxophone down too much, right? In the context of what you're scoring right in here, they're going to work fine, right? Um, it can be a concern though, because uh, saxophones can blend beautifully with strings, uh, and then they can also just dominate strings, right? That one one example is uh, there's a score by Mio, um, uh, in which he uses the uh, saxophone in the place of the viola part, right? And sometimes there's a beautiful blend with the rest of the strings. It's a chamber orchestra, similar to this. Uh, but even even more stripped down, and you know sometimes it blends beautifully, and sometimes that just that middle voice becomes so powerful it's sort of like a super viola. Okay, um, continuing on, yeah. So just balance that, balance that, and just watch out. Like when you have this a section like this where there's sort of a diminution of parts, you know, like where your first violin is dropping off kind of into nothing, right? That it you, you sort of don't feel the part disappear so much that there's a smoother transition, right? You know, da 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 ba 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 right? You know, you like you are trading down to this, but you're also losing a voice. Right? Well meanwhile you've got these really strong brass in the middle kind of pushing their way through the texture and they're they're kind of messing up the effect of these other instruments. Here you're starting Sforzando going towards pianissimo or excuse me towards piano and here you're going piano towards a forte i'm not sure that you need to do that so much like you know have this d kind of come from nothing i i, I see what you're what you're doing here you're having the d come out of the out of the horn sound right in there uh but i think that if you just mark the d uh at a normal you know, at a normal dynamic level, the, the same thing will pretty much happen because the horn will be so much more forceful on that note. Yeah, and then just molto marcato right in here and staccato. Uh, that, that all works fine. It's very simple, a very simple scoring, and it does transition smoothly to the next thing. So, yeah, so, I mean, it's a... You, you went with a... Uh, a more basic approach here and you know more you know what I'm giving you feedback on is more in in the light of that kind of more chamber scoring approach but you've got some really great stuff going on and I regret that I'm not able to really evaluate it and go into huge detail about it um, yeah but just very cool approaches and and you know very tantalizing um, <clears throat> so so yeah uh, just some general thoughts about your orchestration style, I would say, like, it, it seems to me that you are holding back quite a bit in terms of big textures, um, you know, filling in, uh, having instruments double each other, uh, thinking about the bigger picture, um, you know, in terms of big tutis and, and um, instruments having, like, kind of block roles, you know, where where the winds all kind of work together in one function and the brass in another and the and the strings in yet another um, and and the interdependency of them. So I'd say focus on that. You know, study some bigger scores. Um, you know, starting from your comfort zone, just really challenge yourself to, you know, pay attention to some of those factors um, and, you know, apply them to certain, you know, challenges that you put to yourself, whether it's this or you know these orchestration challenges or other things and 
um, you know, just just reiterate. I think I think you would find the next challenge quite interesting, and um, you know, and and it would also sort of force you to deal with certain issues in your scoring that you are you know that you are kind of getting around from time to time by applying different approaches than than the normal kind of well i mean there is no normal kind of entry then um the weight of where a lot of entries are going to you know to have big um <clears throat> kind of big orchestral uh, landscapes and and you know very vivid colors and so on and so forth so there's kind of no escaping certain uh, certain issues around scoring. It's not exactly what I'm talking about because I'm not giving away what that what this piece is. It's quite unusual and extraordinary and, and lovely, uh, but it is something that is really going to require a certain amount of integrated orchestration, right? So I would say look into orchestration that has a kind of integration to it and interdependency. And I think that that is really going to make you stronger as an orchestrator. Okay, so <clears throat> that's enough of this score. Uh, so, so happy to take a look at it, Sasha, and really appreciate your participation in this challenge. And now, on to the final score for this group. Uh, this is bringing a huge smile to my face, Anastasia. I just really enjoyed um, looking at this, and uh, the mock-up is actually very effective and illustrative of, of how the orchestra would sound. It, it, it's just so nicely done. And uh, I think that there is a lot of, there's a lot of heart in this, you know, like a lot of sincerity. Uh, and and there's a lot of cleverness too, and, you know. And I, I feel there you have a, a good sense of humor in this, and you are, you know, you're you're doing things in the right way for the right re right reasons, and and it just is a delight to listen to. Okay, so so um, I'm just going to talk about some of my favorite things, uh, and in the context of the. Uh, the evaluation criteria as uh, you know, going forward. Um, so I, I really love this right in here, like the uh, the flutes and piccolo and violins taking over the end of the melody, and then the uh, the bassoon family and uh, lower heavy brass along with uh, ro along with horn. I'm not sure which horn. I uh, like your one one thing that I, I will sort of um, uh, call you out on a little bit is not telling us how many of what is playing when, right? You know, it, it seems to me like these lines right in here work better as individual players, but then, you know, in these massive, this massive tutti scoring, it probably you mean atu flutes and oboes and clarinets and so on and bassoons. Now your bassoons are really widely spaced apart. Now you, and you've got the weight, of course, of your bass trombone and tuba in between the the bassoons and the contrabassoon, right? So it it's that kind of fills that in and and takes away some of the necessity of of that scoring. But then you've got your your bassoons themselves doubling the trombones, right? So you know you could have your bassoons down an octave. Uh, providing more unity with the contrabassoon, and it would make absolutely no difference to who, whether you were doubling trombones or bass trombone and tuba, right? And you could even drop your tuba down another octave to double the contrabassoon and get um, get a more powerful kind of a sound. So you know, those are just some things to think about. It's you know, you're giving a lot to the contrabassoon just to be carrying the very bottom of the uh, of the sound picture right and and meanwhile you've got your double basses and your cellos up right 
But this is a situation where I think that having them down is is a little bit better. It just depends on how much you want the the cellos to be part of what the violas are doing or not, right? Okay, but but I still kind of love this um, this trade off between the melody up here and the melody down there. And I would say like for that quality alone, <laughs> that I'm going to give you a pass on the thematic material sort of being a copy paste, right? You know, of this part and this part of them being identical. <clears throat> now there is something, you know, an issue about this, like telling me that there are four horns here and only scoring two parts, you know, which two parts are playing what, right? So is this supposed to be one and three and two and four? Uh, or, you know, is it supposed to be one and two, three and four, in which case you should have both voices in each part, right? So you should have the Bs on the bottom here uh, in second voice. So that would be first and second. And then the copy of that below, third and fourth, right? Um, and yeah, because I, I just really feel like a single horn is too weak right in here. In fact, you could even throw in more horns than that, right? To... Um, to play along with um, your trombones and bass trombone and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, I think I, I think I left this score untransposed, so I'm just going to jump over here. Yeah, so to you know to add transposition to the score immediately changes a lot of the context of what you know of what you can see here and and. You know, it just makes it all the more important that um, that certain things be attended to, like you know, one and two, ah, two kind of you know markings and so on. Okay, um, so so that is one of the criteria that is fine. Now the other thing is like um, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano. That's not a big concern. Um, the melodic development soaring fairly high, you kind of get around that with this beautiful dance in between, you know, like between the different members of your winds and strings and so on. Now, there's a, there is a bit of a demarcation between trading off between players, and that's, you know, sometimes you dovetail and sometimes you don't, right? And like choosing to dovetail or not to dovetail, um, it just really has an effect on the music. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But yeah, but it, it's, you know, it's like whether you are having instruments calling and responding to each other or whether you're having instruments carrying on from each other, right? Um, yeah, but, you know, this is all just so much fun. The English horn running around there, and you've got your clarinets and bass clarinet and, and all those other things happening in there. It's just so much fun. Now, I feel it, it's a, it can be a little unnecessary from time to time, but, it you know, it's still, it's kind of fun to have the lines thrown back and forth. Uh, yeah, and this this is very strong right here, doubling all this up right in here. And then the piccolo coming down but that you know right here you're getting to the point where the piccolo is just like is completely not needed you could just stop right on this d is my feeling and then just leave the rest of the of the rest of the bar blank because nobody is really going to hear it and then you know right in here you got this doubling i mean i mean the way that you have your piccolo part scored up to around right here it might as well just be third flute right because all of those pitches are way stronger on the on the on like another C flute than they would be on piccolo. So you don't even really need the piccolo until you run up to this E, right? So like from F to E, yeah, the piccolo scoring makes perfect sense. But then coming afterwards, you you once again demote your piccolo part to the role of a third flute player, right? So yeah, may, maybe, you know, with the fact that all the ingenuity that you are putting into this, maybe you don't even need the piccolo, right? Um, of course, like you are running up from here and you want to reach that E, so you sort of do need it. But other, other than that, that's the only reason why you need piccolo instead of a third flute by the, by judging by the rest of the way that you're scoring everything. Okay. Um, yeah, but, you know, nicely done in terms of like the, like 
you know, I, I have one of, as one of my criteria, the accompaniment figures covering a wide range. And here we do kind of get into some concerns, right? You ha you're having your violas and cellos um, play octaves based on the accompaniment pattern. And I mean, it's certainly possible, but it's just, you know, it's just kind of not very comfortable. There's also the, the other concern that this would be much better as scored in uh, in tenor clef. It just would be easier for the player to work out the fingerings and everything else. I mean, it's 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 doable. It's just not, you know, it's, it's just kind of, um, this is a lot of work, you know. Um, and maybe there are ways of making it simpler, uh, you know, like maybe divisi between two different groups of players. Maybe the maybe you could have something where the viola part is interactive between uh, second violins taking the upper part of it and the the cellos taking the lower part, so that they don't have to jump up, you know, way up to this high B over and over and over again, right? So may, maybe there is a way of of dealing with that big jump, right? That isn't so annoying, right? You know, some of the elements showing up in other parts and so on and so forth, so that it, it trades things around. <clears throat> like, for instance, here's, here's a possible solution. So what if this E right here was played by the double bass? Okay? And then you had your cello centered around playing E, B, B, right? So you have them covering this octave up here. And then this is no problem, right, in tenor clef. And then once again, having the double bass cover this E right in here. <clears throat> so instead, your double, your cellos could be playing that same E. So they just repeat this E right in here and then go B, B. And then the violas uh, just change to, to treble clef. And they just do, you know, E, B, B in treble clef where it's just easier to read and it's kind of all part of the same register. It's just like, you know, it, it, kind, it kind of ends up chopping things up a bit, but it's just easier, you know, like you have to think about people never having enough time to practice. So the, the simpler, not necessarily easier, but the simpler and more straightforward you can make it in terms of fingering and accessibility of things, the better. All right, and then, yeah, just kind of the same thing again. And then this, I felt, was just so beautiful, the way that this was all managed. <coughs> uh, I liked the English horn part and the, the clarinets and bass clarinet and everything else. It's all really nice, okay? Uh, I don't know if there's really any need for the bass clarinet to run up like this. Um, yeah, it's all totally possible, but... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I just, I don't know if it, I don't know if it really is, you know. I mean, I, I guess like, it's, it's the same note as the English horn, and it's, I mean, I just, I'm just, just not so sure. I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, you might as well throw it in there. I mean, they, they're putting a little red thing on it, and that's not what concerns me. It's just whether or not it's, it's that functional of a bass clarinet part. But, yeah, you know, I mean. A lot of bass clarinet players like to play high, so I won't take that away from them. And then right in here, I really love this. Like this is, I feel that this is some of the best um, integrated scoring on the entire page. The way that the functions, there's the doublings, and the way that the instruments are working together, everything else. I really, really liked uh, what is going on in here. I feel it's pretty strong. And you know, once again, you can just you can just leave the. Um, the piccolo out from here onwards because it's not really contributing much of anything. Yeah, you know, the clarinet part, the English horn and, and bass clarinet working together. We got, you know, that doubling in the viola and um, this, you know, this is nice. Like, so, so here's an example of a longer note being played like in support of the yet da 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 bum right? So it's that second... The coming in on the second beat, pushing into the first beat, right? So that doesn't necessarily interrupt the momentum of the um, of the rhythm right in here. 
Yeah, and yeah, you're pushing your cellos really high, right? And just kind of counting on once again your your lower brass and bassoons to sort of fill in the some of the lower stuff. And I mean, it kind of kind of works, sort of. Yeah. Yeah, and then this is all. This cup. This sort of takes us to the whole thing, maintaining a driving staccato, right? So there definitely is a, an, a sense of interruption here because you're not uh, you're not transitioning on the downbeat, right? So if you want to make this an absolutely perfectly smooth transition between this phrase and that phrase, then have them dovetail on the downbeat, right? And then it'll you know you you'll you'll if you're paying attention, of course you'll be able to tell that you're going from violas to cellos and from English horn to clarinet and so on. I mean, that's, 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 that is obvious. However, like the way you've got it divided here, it is an intentional interruption of the, of the smoothness and the clarity of timbre and everything else. So if you want that, then that is really nicely done. If that is part of your very clever approach to this, then that's fine. It's brilliant, right? But if you don't want that, then dovetail on the downbeat. Okay, so <laughs> um, I've just once again really enjoyed this. I enjoyed this looking at this entry and all of the entries today. Once again, apologies about the mic noise. And uh, I will, I'm just really looking forward to what is coming up. It's actually Father's Day, it's New Zealand Father's Day. They have it on uh, in September rather than in June, like in North America. And uh, I, you know, I'm 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 really kind of enjoying sitting down here, and everybody else I think is just starting to get up. So um, I might do actually do another set of evaluations this morning uh, if everybody is doing other things, and then take a nice little walk later today. But really, really great spending this time with you all. And, you know, I, if, if you are happy about the evaluation that I gave you and you feel good about it and you, you know, you, you want, you know, if you're feeling grateful about it, then the best way to repay me is to comment on everybody else's entry. Seriously. Um, that is the most constructive thing you could do. That is the thing that will make me want to continue to evaluate your scores in the future. The more people comment on each other's, you know, especially the people in each group. Right. And even if it's just a comment to say, hey, I liked what you did there. Or, you know, I really enjoyed your uh, your arrangement. Um, or if it's just a suggestion saying, oh, boy, I wish that you could have used timpani in your score. Um, I felt that it was really helpful in my score. You know, things like that. Or, you know, hey, you know, I can't I, I would love to see what you do with a bigger orchestra. Or, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if you had used a smaller orchestra on that? You know, just it doesn't you don't have to be talking from the. Uh, from the perspective of an expert, right, to uh, give somebody constructive feedback, or just you know, or just to to you know share the experience of having been in the same evaluation group, right? You know, it just really makes this community so much stronger when people take the time to um, you know to interact with each other in this way, and it you know and makes it a lot more interesting in the comments rather than you know. People just uh, pointing out that I got one or two notes wrong in the uh, <laughs> in the uh, template, right? So, uh, so thanks so much, everybody, and I will uh, be back. Uh, I think that the only way that I'm going to get through this entire run of 165 entries is going to be with daily releases. So, you know, just get used to it, because more is coming probably every day. There might be an interruption from time to time as there are fewer in certain categories, but I might be filling in those days with other entries, uploads, updates, and other kinds of things. So stay posted for that. Thanks again to all of my entrants and for taking the time to be part of this. I really do appreciate it. And now, on to the next video.